Hello, everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright. Wow. Here on Live 95, right here with that Nikki is, Kinzer. That is a fancy introduction. <laughs> How you doing, Nikki Kinzer? I'm doing great. Can I'm I tell you why really I'm well. exuberant? Can I tell you why I'm yes. excited? Because Please. Nano Nano is over. Nano Nano. Yep. How As, did you do? I Well, okay. So, do you remember what my starting goal was? Well, I, originally for you, it was the 50,000. 50,000 and a finished story. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, where did we end up? I ended up with a total word count of, um, I don't remember exactly, 52,500 something or other and change. And I finished two days early. I crossed that line wow. like on the 28th. Now, the second one was a finished story, and this is where there be monsters here. I am so close. I can feel it. I can feel how close I am to the end of this ridiculous journey, and I have to do it. So I'm still trying to write every day as I get to the end, but these characters have a mind of their own. Like Every time I sit down and write, I do. introduce something <laughs> new and complex. So uh, NaNoWriMo is, is over. I did achieve the 50,000 in under 30 days, and um, it was the easiest experience telling the story that I have ever had in as long as I've been doing NaNoWriMo since 2002, whatever. Um, and so it, it was enormously gratifying to actually finish it. Uh, a huge, 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 massive, huge shout out to Ellie B, Ellie in, in uh, uh, Discord mm -hmm. and the community, uh, who's my nano buddy, uh, also finished. And she had a yeah, come did. from behind moment. I think her last day, she ended up with 7,500 words. That's right. an extraordinary lift to, to hit yes. that in your last day. And she's got school and she's a new mama and it's just a lot. So wow. um, a massive shout out to everybody who has been sort of following along our journey in Discord. It's been really fun. And um, uh, thank you for letting us um, wax on a little bit about our, our experience this year. Okay. But wait, we're not moving on yet. Oh, okay. So you're almost done. You're almost yeah. finished. So what is the plan on getting that finished? Yeah. Um, so my plan at this point is to finish by the end of this week. Like I would like to be oh, done great. by Friday midnight, you know, and, and I think I'm, okay. I think I'm there because, and I'm not really, I'm not being terribly precious about the end of the book because this is the first draft. Like this is That's I, right. Doesn't I, have to I, be it perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect, but I, it does have to be finished so that I have something to work on. And Correct. that yeah. has been a thing that's gotten in the way for me in the past, which is not finish. And then I have nothing to edit. I have nothing to come back right. to in, a, in yeah. a, a month or something. So that's my goal is to write. I, I think I can do it in 6,000 words. I think that's my, that's my plan. So. And are you going to post this goal into Discord in the Nano Nano chat? Uh, in the Nano Nano channel? chat, yes, Nano Rimo twenty twelve. Okay, I will do that. Okay. I will post the goal. Yes, in Nano. You're going to post the goal, and then you'll let us know um, what night. happens. Yes, yeah. that's my plan. Yeah, and if you're not at the goal on Friday night, are you still going to post and let us know what's going on? Uh, no, I'm going to hide from it. <laughs> yeah, like no, I normally see, do. I'm going to climb yeah, under my bed hiding. and just wait there. <laughs> Until Gosh, I next swear, year. I think you can see into my brain <laughs> because I was, yeah, that's exactly what I was hoping you would not say. Yes. No, I said it. I said it. And that's the truth. That's the reality. I will hide from myself yeah. and mostly nope. from you. So no, that's good. no hiding. Nope. <laughs> so no, no I, we'll work. We'll work with you. We're yeah. going to make this happen for you. That's the deal. Uh, so I've got a couple more days to wrap this up. I'm pretty excited about it. So uh, that's that's good for my you. Only Congratulations! News. Thank you. That's exciting. Thank you. We are going to be talking to uh, one of our very favorite people. Sharon Saline is back, and she is a therapist, and she is going to following up on our conversation last week with Bill Dodson. We talked all about medication in the treatment of ADHD, and this week, if you've never been in any sort of therapeutic experience, Sharon's going to help us uh, teach you what you can expect uh, working as a client. Uh, with your own brand new shiny therapist. Uh, and, and it's really great. Before we do that, head over to TakeControlADHD.com. You can get to know us a little bit better. You can listen to the show right there on the website or, of course, subscribe to the show or subscribe to the mailing list on the website and uh, we'll send you an email each time a new episode is released. You can connect with us on Twitter or Facebook at Take Control ADHD. And if the show has ever touched you or helped you make a change in your life for the better, uh, head over to patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. Uh, 
Patreon is listener supported podcasting. It allows us to thrive with your direct support. And it's amazing. It is such an incredible gift that you supporting members give us to be able to focus more of our time and attention on this show and this community. And we are working on all kinds of new and wonderful things. So if, if you have found that this show has served you in some way over the past of our understanding your relationship with ADHD and how you live your life with it and uh, uh, learn new strategies and incorporate new tools, we hope you'll consider patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast to learn more and a very massive, huge hug and thanks to Hillary Gill and Soma Angelus and Corey Fisher and John Foster and Ali Thompson and Stephanie Quain for joining us uh, recently as brand new patrons and a very special thanks to Anna Parika and Allison Kaczmarek for upgrading your support very recently. We so appreciate you all of you uh, for joining the ADHD community. Patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. All right, Nikki, what do you got? Well, first of all, I have to do another special shout out to John Foster because uh, his patience is really, really good. He has really good patience. <laughs> yeah, so, he's been run through and, the tech support. And understanding. <laughs> yes. So, yes, we he had purchased um, one of our online courses and it's been um, very difficult for some reason on the back end to get him into this course, which doesn't happen. It's a and real mystery. It is a, it real, is a mystery. real mystery. And we're still trying to figure it out. But he, you know, I've apologized. And I said, thank you for your patience. And he's so kind because he comes back. He's like, no, no apologies. I get it. It's okay. And just a really lovely response. And I just have to express my gratitude because it could have easily gone the other way, you know, of yeah. You, you, what are you doing? You're, you, <laughs> whatever, but it wasn't like that. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your, uh, your, your, uh, patience and, um, grace. Perseverance. <laughs> yes. Yes. And we are going to figure it out. Oh, yes. Definitely. Yeah. All right. But I have some other things to talk about. Woo. And boy, do I ever. I know you've got so, a lot. I hope that people will bear with me because um, I do have a lot of exciting things to share that I'm going to be doing in 2022. And I want to talk about them on the podcast. And I also want to make sure you know where to go get uh, where to go if you have questions or you want additional information or you want to sign up. Uh, so New services and returning services that are happening in 2022. We, Pete Wright, and I hope you join me. You're part of the <laughs> okay, we. Okay. <laughs> we are going to be holding an organizing challenge. And it's going to start January 1st. And it's going to go through January 31st. And we're going to play the game that you have taught us to play in the past. I taught you to play? Yes. Very this exciting. is that. Yes, that's the it's it's the purging game, right? Mm -hmm. So each day of the month, we're going to let go of clutter. So what we want to do is we are going to basically collect all of these items as we go through each day. So day one, you're going to find one item to let go of, and it's just going to keep going. So like by the time you're on day 15, you're letting go of 15 items that day. But new keep items in mind, every day. New it's a items. New item every day. Yes. So imagine that by the end of the month, I don't know what the math is. I'm sure you probably do, but it's a lot of stuff <laughs> that has been let go. And you've done some really great work here, right? Yes. Yeah. You've done it's, this. It's you've done lot. this We've several done it, years. I've done it many years. And in fact, it, it concerns me a little bit when I to pledge my participation because uh we have we've acquired new things, but because we do this every year, our clutter stash is is lower than it's been in a while. So I'm, Oh, you'll find stuff. I know. I hope I find that many stuffs. It's a lot yeah. of stuff that you're giving paper. away. Paper. You could get rid of paper. Can, and I, get, can. I can. I yeah, mean, really, honestly, because yeah. I thought the same thing, because I'm going to be doing some um, organizing during the our Christmas break. I, you know, we take some time off and uh, I'm definitely going to be doing this in December. And I thought, well, what if I do everything in December? And I'm thinking, really, really, am I going to do everything in December? Of course, I'm not. Uh, so I know 
you know, even if you're thinking you might not have enough, you're going to have enough. Yeah, I'll find, I'll, I'll figure yeah. it out. Figure it out uh, so the whole thing that we want to do is we don't want you to feel like you have to do this alone. So we want to add some support for you. We want to add some structure to this process. And so that's why we're offering this workshop uh, and this game around this workshop in the month of January. So what's going to happen is we are going to hold two organizing study halls over the weekend. So you're going to have two hours on Saturday to purge and two hours on Sunday. Uh, you are going to be working alongside myself. I don't know if that is really a perk in this. <laughs> oh, no. You're feeling you a little bit me. sassy to me right now, like yeah. a little bit <laughs> troublesome. Well, you know, it was your idea to say, oh, Nikki, well, you should bring your laptop around so they can actually see you physically doing it, too. Oh, so, wait, this is like, this is a, a, you're getting me back for this now? Yes. <laughs> oh, I see how this works. Yes. So, uh, I'm going to do at least one of the weekends, and then I, uh, I I think that one of my assistants are going to help me, help me too, but I may be there both. I don't know, but you're going to get support no matter what. It's going to be a hosted organizing study hall for two hours each of those days. And then we're also going to offer, or I'm going to offer, because I'm going to be answering the questions, a w weekly office hours. So Tuesdays and Fridays at 8 a.m. Pacific or 11 a.m. Eastern. I'm going to be available for people to just drop in whenever you want and ask questions. And I'm going to answer them about mm -hmm. organizing. So if you're stuck somewhere and you want to talk through something, um, come to the to the office hours and I'm going to help you. The other or the other part of this that I think is really cool is we are opening up the Discord. We're going to have a channel that is that is special for this organizing challenge. And this is going to be for you to connect with others that are doing the challenge, sharing your updates, posting pictures, really just supporting one another. Because I know doing enough coaching groups in the past the the information you can get from other ADHDers is just it's so valuable like you know t tips and tricks and things mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. now the cost of the workshop is only $75 for the entire month so i want you to think about this for a second $75 for the month you're getting 16 hours of organizing study halls that's 16 hours of organizing yeah that's a lot of organizing with a person right yeah one of at least eight of those are going to be with me for sure. Eight hours of the opportunity to to do the the ask me anything, uh, and you're going to get a Discord channel to keep you accountable and and have some fun while you're doing this. Yeah. Now the Discord channel will be available at no cost. So if you still want to participate in this workshop, but you don't necessarily feel like you need the guiding piece of it that we're offering. That's fine. We still want you to be a part of this. And uh, because our point is for you to clear the clutter and start the new year with more space, but less stress. Oh, listen Does that to you. Sound more like space, a, less stress. Right? Yeah. I know. I should go Put on the info on commercials. I know. Right. So the Discord channel is going to be um, free for everyone. And if you are interested in the more structured um, study halls and uh, office hours, then it will be $75 for the month. OK, All let right. me just tell you, because that uh, the, to uh, your point about the community and and I think a, if you're going to do it and you're going to participate in the Discord channel, you've got to post your daily picture. Right of the stuff that you're, you're. I think getting, that would be great. Right. Yes, I, we've done it uh, so many years now. But the only reason I sh I can say that we have been successful every year is because we do it with a community of people. And in our case, we have a shared photo album that we add the daily picture to every single day. And so we're looking at the stuff that other people are giving are giving away or cluttering or or decluttering or throwing away, and we're posting ours. And it is so so valuable and uh because it's it's really easy it's really easy to let yes. it to let it go and when you when you yes, have that it is that little motivator of get in the community get in the study all create something to to declutter your life it, it keeps you moving it keeps you moving absolutely so. And it's that a little bit of that accountability too yep. that it gives you a reason to do it, yeah. you know, because you get to post your picture and that's right. cool. And you're going to cool. have people really cheering you on. So that's awesome. Okay. Next thing that is returning is GPS. 
And GPS is uh, my guided planning sessions. So if you're not sure what I'm really talking about here, uh, what we do is on Mondays, we plan, uh, it's a workshop. So you're planning the week ahead. And on Thursday, we adjust that plan. And then we look toward the weekend if you're ready to, to move on um, past the week. What we do is we follow a process that I've put together and I teach this process uh, during the first week. And it's where you learn how to uh, how to plan, where to start, how to prioritize, how to match your to-do list with your calendar to get things done. And what's so awesome about it is that you've got the guidance of myself to help you, but you've got other people that you're doing this with too. Again, that community of being able to help each other out um, is so helpful. And and I have done this for the last year and it's been such a success and I'm so excited about holding it again in 2022. And uh, so to let you guys know, uh, enrollment is open for the next GPS session. It will begin on January 10th and the enrollment deadline is January 5th. So if you want to be part of the next GPS, uh, you, you'll need to sign up before January 5th. That is GPS. I have one more. That's it. There's more. Okay. I have one more. Excellent. One that more. That I'm also really right. excited about. So the third service that I'm really excited about talking to you about is the accountability groups. Now, this is something that I did a couple of years ago, and I'm bringing it back because it is important and they're really fun to do. And I think, you know, there's a need here for uh people to support each other and have some accountability to get some stuff, you know, to get some stuff done. And so I'm going to change it up just a little bit from what I did before. So if you were actually a past member, you may see a little bit of change, uh, change that I'm doing going forward. Uh, but what this group is about, the mission of this group is to help you get things done. It's to help you uh, get started on those projects that you're avoiding, those things that are so hard uh, to do and you feel so bad about them just moving over to the next week. And so this group is going to be really good for those folks who are struggling with this and they know that accountability works for them. And maybe you're not quite sure if accountability works for you, but let's try it because it very well might, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Uh, there's a lot of magic in this. We have weekly sessions that we are going to meet. There's going to be three different times that we can meet. You will have a primary session, like you'll have like your session. However, if you can't make your session for whatever reason, you can join um, one of the other two that week. So you don't miss it. Uh, we're going to have hosted study halls. They're going to be Wednesdays and Thursdays. We're going to have a community board that's going to be extremely active. Um, I'm going to require um, a little bit more from the members okay. than maybe I have in the past. So I'm hoping that that people, you know, if you're going to sign up for this, I, I definitely want you to be uh, involved. This is not for the passive accountability person. Like we want you to really kind of like you were talking about with the organizing, yeah. like posting your picture every day, like I want you to post every day. <laughs> yeah, right. Of I mean, what's well, going on? I, yeah, I, I think there's a there, there's something a little bit oxymoronic in the passive accountability person, right? If you're ready for an accountability group, you should be ready for action. Yes, and that's exactly what I'm going to to promote here. Uh, we're also going to hold, I'm going to have a monthly workshop on a topic uh, that is just around planning. And that is just going to be for this accountability group. It's not going out to the public. It's not a webinar. It is for these groups. And so that's something extra that they can look forward to and uh, hopefully help them, you know, with uh, getting stuff done. And we also have a resource library that has a ton of information that you can go back to, to in between sessions, after the session. Um, I'm going to stop there. There's a lot more I can probably talk about with the accountability group, but it is not starting until February. So right now what I'm doing is planting the seed, folks. Yeah. I'm planting the seed that this is happening in February. You're going to hear me talk more about it uh, at, at the end of this year, but also in January, I'm going to talk more about it as well. Outstanding. Are we, so that's it. That's the whole thing. That's You're done it. With all the oh, that's it. Yeah, that's wanna, all. <laughs> all right. Let's, uh, why don't we go over and, and talk to Dr. Sharon? That sounds great. All right.
Welcome to Sharon Celine. She has uh, she's a gracious repeat guest to us. She has been uh, working, uh, focusing on ADHD, anxiety, learning differences, and mental health challenges, and and their impact on school and family dynamics for over thirty years. Today, she's going to help us understand what the experience looks like when starting therapy for the first time. If you haven't checked out her book. What Your ADHD Child Wishes You Knew, Working Together to Empower Kids for Success in School and Life. It's amazing. And last time she was here, she was talking to us about her uh, now re now published ADHD Solution Deck, which I hope she will talk to us about a little bit later. Sharon, welcome back, friend. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to be here. And the minute I saw your faces on Zoom, I was like, oh, so happy. <laughs> Us well, too, we for are sure. Yes, for sure. Thank you for your time and and uh, and helping us understand a little bit about this therapy thing. Because this is what we've done in the last couple of weeks. Is, is we've really been trying to focus on different ways to uh, treat and navigate through ADHD. And therapy comes up, you know, as one of those pieces of puzzles, right? Or one of the pieces of the puzzle, and. But a lot of people who have never been to therapy maybe don't really know what it is or what you would you go to therapy for your ADHD? Can you give us just a starting point of what that might look like in your own practice? Of course. So we know that ADHD very rarely travels alone. It has friends. Mm -hmm. It has friends like anxiety, it has depression, uh, learning disabilities, um, uh, you know, level one autism, um, bipolar disorder, substance abuse. I mean, all the things that people live with, whether or not they have ADHD, come along with ADHD. And so people come to therapy often uh, for those, what I call coexisting conditions, more than they might necessarily come for, I need help with my ADHD. Sometimes okay. people come for um, my, you know, I, I'm not organized. I can't, I, I can't get stuff done. I don't like myself. These are things that um, I see commonly with ADHD. I also see a lot of social anxiety. I don't have the relationships I would like. I have trouble making friends. I'm very sensitive to rejection. So all of those things are issues that, you know, humans live with and that people with ADHD um, have a higher proclivity of living with. And so the therapy mm -hmm. is, for me, it's a dance between cognitive behavioral interventions that are directed towards improving executive functioning skills and that insight oriented work. You know, who am I? Who do I want? How do I want to be perceived in the world? What do I, what do I like about myself? What could I just figure out that I like about myself? Um, how can I be in relationships in a way that's more rewarding to me and um, satisfying to the people around me? That's a lot to uncover, right? So if if I was your new client and I tell you, you know, I've got ADHD, I know I'm dealing with some depression, definitely some anxiety, mm -hmm. and can give you lots of different examples of where that's, that's uh, happening in my life, where do you start? Like, how do you start to unravel the the pieces like where do you focus well probably for me you know i usually take a couple sessions to obviously we want i want to get to know you right and so mm -hmm. you say well you're coming here you, you you feel anxious you feel a little depressed you have adhd the question that i would ask is why are you coming to therapy now what's happening now mm -hmm. that's brought you here to my office mm -hmm. and then we unpack that a little bit and then i want to get some information mm -hmm. when were you diagnosed how do you feel about your diagnosis? What, um, what do you think some of your strengths are? What are some of your challenges? Do you notice there's a pattern to your anxiety? Tell me more about your depression. Uh, what does it look like? What, what, what does it feel like? When, when do you notice those moments when you're feeling most anxious or depressed? And, and how, what does depressed mean to you? Like, that's the thing that I really mm -hmm. want to unpack, like the meaning behind these labels. So, okay, you have ADHD. 
what does that feel like to you? You know, what kind of brain is it? Is it a foggy brain? Is it a fast brain? Is it a dreamy brain? Is it a mm, ADLS or a attention deficit? Look, there's a squirrel brain. Um, you know, I, I want right. to unpack things. And of course, you know, that means getting a history. Like, is there are any of these things in your family? Because we know that with anxiety and depression, there's a predisposition to it in families. The thing that brings you to therapy today question seems like it's carrying an awful lot of weight. And and when yes. I talk to when I talk to people about like their experience <laughs> about what are the things that actually push them to to therapy, it it always comes back to some sort of inflection point that defines their readiness for change. Mm -hmm. That that whatever it is that they have that they've been living through, they suddenly realize that the the internal pain that comes from not knowing what therapy looks like, and therefore it causes me stress and anxiety and fear, mm -hmm. to everything else in my life is worse than that pain and fear and uncertainty. So I'm going to go ahead and move into, into therapy. And so I, I just wonder from your perspective, what that inflection point, like what being a witness to that inflection looks like for people living with ADHD who come to you for guidance and support. That's a really good question. And the word that comes to mind is suffering. You know, how how much are you suffering in your daily life? Where is that occurring? Um, what what is that what is the impetus for for that's made you decide, you know what, I need to pivot. I need to change. I don't like this anymore. And for some people, it's a slow burn. It's like I'm, I, I, they, it takes them a long time to get there. And for other people, it's, it can just be like, just one day you wake up, you've stepped off the cliff and you don't want to go back. So I think it, it really mm -hmm. depends. Right now, um, I just was reading a statistic that there have been more emergency room visits due to anxiety and depression in the last year than ever recorded, particularly for young people. Oh, I can see that for sure in my own environment, my own community. You know, yeah. COVID has been really hard um, for those people. Yeah. It's I, hard for a lot of us and it's not mm -hmm. over. Like that's part of that. It's not so over. That's one of yeah. the challenges. So there are two kinds, there are really two types of trauma. Um, there's single incident trauma, uh, which is a one-time thing. I'm in a car accident and I need to deal with the, you know, sort of resulting um, legacy of that car accident, um, whether it's hard to be, drive again, or, you know, I have physical ailments or whatever it is. And then there's complex trauma, which is trauma that occur, reoccurs over time. And that can be physical abuse or sexual abuse or elder abuse, but it can also be the trauma of a thousand paper cuts, uh, the trauma of racism, the trauma of homophobia, uh, the trauma of living with ADHD and feeling like every day you're missing something, you're missing the mark or you're not measuring up or you don't get it right. And so um, with COVID, it's complex trauma because it's it, it changes and it morphs and it continues. We haven't been able as a world and particularly as a country to get relief from it for any lasting amount of time. I, that that complex trauma, uh, you know, the complex trauma of COVID, but also the complex trauma of, of ADHD. This mm -hmm. is the proverbial straw on the camel's back yes. where every day you're dealing with this. And eventually, you know, back to this impetus for change, you, you know, uh, point, eventually you're you realize that or you are intervened upon that you need some help. You need okay. some support. So uh, let's let's talk just briefly then about what a new patient to therapy might expect? So for me, I call them clients, even though I have my doctorate. And that has to do with my, my perspective and how I was changed. I don't want, I mean, I think that the dynamic of you being a patient and me being a doctor is super loaded. And there's an implicit yeah. assumption that I'm well, and you're not. And, you know, I'm like as neurotic and crazy as the next person, you know? <laughs> right. Talk to my kids. They'll definitely affirm that. So, um, so I want to, I want, I want to present myself as 
you know, I have expertise in this area, but I'm also very human. And, um, mm-hmm. and I think that's very healing to people who come to work with me um, because I'm not trying to show that I'm better or that I have all the answers or for God forbid that I figured it all out because none of that is true. You know, I just have mm-hmm. a lot of experience knowledge, study in the field of psychology and being with people and helping you figure out where you're going on your journey. I'm your, I'm your guide. You know, when people come to work with me, they better buckle up their seatbelt because I am in your face. (laughs) I'm very direct. I'm very direct. So I'm curious about that. Like, how so? Give us an example of how, how what that looks like. You know, there are there are different kinds of therapeutic styles. Some people are more passive. Uh, some people mm-hmm. are more active. I am an active therapist. Obviously, I'm listening. Mm-hmm. I'm paying attention. But we are engaging in a conversation. Um, I, I think that I'm witnessing my my clients. Some people are much less active, and they don't um, they, they don't share. Uh, they don't kind of reveal parts of themselves in in ways. I mean, I try to do that as thoughtfully as possible. I'm very careful mm-hmm. about when I dis- disclose um, because it has an effect on my client. But I also feel like um, not like just being a blank wall is not who I am, and it's not who I'm mm-hmm. going to be. And I feel like particularly for people with ADHD, um, they need that kind of interaction. They need to feel like. Um, they're being met where they are, that they're understood, Mm -hmm. and that it's okay for them to be exactly as they are. I I personally associate therapy a lot with CBT. Mm -hmm. Like I think of that, uh, cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, Tell us a little bit more about about that? Like, why does that come to my mind when I think of therapy? Well, Aaron Beck, who just recently died, and I actually had the pleasure of meeting one time. um, He, he founded, you know, he was sort of the father of cognitive therapy. And the reason that we think about cognitive therapy a lot in the United States, when we think about therapy is because it's very result oriented. You know, you need, you need to learn, change how you're thinking. It's kind of like mind. There's a book once mind over mood. I'm going to be able to change my thoughts and that's going to change how I'm feeling. And there are therapists who practice pure cognitive behavioral therapy. A lot of therapists practice kind of um, a mix of different things, whether it's internal family systems or uh, acceptance and commitment therapy or, um, eye movement, desensitization, reprogramming, EMDR, um, somatic experiencing. You know, therapists in general, I think, are very oriented toward knowledge, seeking knowledge and uh, better ways to help people. And so um, many therapists, you know, sort of practice a mix of different things. And there are therapists who practice only, you know, CBT um, it's a it's a particular way of being and often those people are tend to be in clinics i think more than in mm. private practice you know when you're looking for a therapist if you are you know are looking for a relationship with somebody to to support you is there anything special about the work that you do with ADHD that might be important to consider for, yes. for looking for, for so a new person? You, you do want someone who does work you know with a cognitive behavioral lens because People who come with ADHD are struggling with the challenges of daily living. They're feeling, they feel disorganized. They may not be able to plan or prioritize. They may have issues with emotional control. Um, They may struggle with memory or motivation. So someone who you work with has to, if you have ADHD, you have to choose someone who actually really understands ADHD. You know, I have a lot of people who come to work with me um, um, who, you know, have seen therapists who, who, you know, have some training in ADHD, but that's not actually what they're, they know about. And so it's hard for them to understand kind of the difference between pathology and ADHD. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, uh, there's a lot of sort of um, thinking about um you know, different kinds of diagnoses rather than seeing this as linked to having ADHD. And that's really important, a very important distinction because my job isn't to make you feel worse about yourself, right? My job is to help you 
own your ADHD and learn how to live with it as effectively as possible and to address the friends that it brings along and to learn how to manage those as well. So I have a uh, an example of a client. It's kind of a case story, I guess. I would love say. case story. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> that I that I'm curious to to see what you would say. Yeah. And and I'll be up front when when this got brought up in the conversation, I did ask about her therapist. Like has she talked to her therapist about this situation cuz uh, you know, as a coach, I felt like it was too much of a gray area for me to help her with. Mm-hmm. Um, so what 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 the situation is is of course with COVID for the last year and a half, 2 years, uh, this person was supposed to be in a graduate program and it was supposed to be live and it's a very artistic type of program. And she was, you know, she feels really cheated out of the first year and, and rightfully so, you know, she had to do everything online. Um, it was very difficult, very a lot of struggle. And now she's in her second year. It's coming to an end before she has to go do her student teaching. And she's feeling angry. She's feeling bitterness. Um, she's very upset, you know, about how, how this is ending and how she, she's just now starting to get what, what this was supposed to be. And, you know, and, and she talks about her ADHD, about how, it, how it really heightened the ADHD because then, you know, she, she was avoiding things. She was procrastination, procrastinating on things, overwhelmed, really harsh on herself, like very, very ashamed uh, about things that she felt like she could have done differently. So I'm curious, um, what you think about that? Like, because, you know, you can't just say, oh, change your mindset. You know, hey, everybody goes through it. I mean, it, well, you can't. Well, like, especially yeah. in the context of the trauma we've been talking about. Like yes, the, the perils exactly. of, of accumulated trauma and right. resentment. Right. So, so right. I would think that this actually is a therapeutic issue. And the issue yeah, is, yeah. is grief. Grief. Yeah. Yes. And okay. that's something that, you know, we haven't talked about yet today. But there's a tremendous amount of grief that people are carrying. Um, mm-hmm. You know, my my daughter is 23 and she lost, you know, a year and a half of college uh, where she wasn't mm-hmm. on campus um, somewhat by her choice, but, you know, um, COVID really, really affected her in a, in a negative way. Mm-hmm. Other people were more adaptable, um, but a lot of particularly, you know, like emerging adults, people in their mid to early, tw- mid, early to mid or even late twenties have had to make huge adjustments and, um, and given up things, the things that they thought were gonna be a particular way. And that's mm-hmm. very hard because it runs actually counter to that stage of development where there is a hopefulness about life and it's unfolding and what your place in the world is going to be. Um, and so it would make sense. I also hear like she's a little bit of depression in that. You know, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. and and depression. You know, we it's very common. People say, "Oh, it's hopelessness and helplessness," and you know, of course, I hear that in what you're saying. You know, there's a sort of yeah, both of those things. And so, those are clinical issues. Those are things that CBT would be good for, with a combination of just being able to sit with um, the loss. Yeah, 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 and and then there's a narrative okay. piece, like what are you telling yourself about that this experience? What is, mm-hmm. what, what was there? Is there another time where you've experienced disappointment? How did that go? And is that legacy, you know, affecting what's happening now at all? I mean, I have to say, I'm glad that I I personally, as a coach, noticed that too. I think for coaches that are listening to this, it's important for us to know what is therapy and what is coaching. And, uh, and I think that's a, it's a, it's a good thing that we talk about that. Well, and, and I think that's a, that brings up a, a, that brings up a really great question, which is not just the difference between therapy and, and coaching, but what are, what, what is the therapeutic experience good for as compared to and distinct from coaching and medication kind of pivoting off of our conversation last week, they're each useful for different things and work together. Can you comment on that? This is like the big, the big question. This is the $94,000 question. In fact, 
Um, last year at the International ADHD Conference, I was on a panel with Ari Tuckman and Elaine Taylor Klaus and Dulce Torres. And this was exactly the thing that we talked about, you know, co uh, coaching versus therapy. And they're not necessarily in opposition to each other. They're actually, they can work very well together. Um, if the therapist is not someone who is well informed about ADHD and can do the kind of concrete, practical, um, uh, focused interventions that a coach can do. Um, I think that medication is an important part of treatment for ADHD. Um, it medicate pills don't teach the skills, but pills make you available to learn the skills and retain them. And, uh, and so uh, it, it, th that can be very useful. It can kind of help you sort of lift the, the kind of the fog that you may feel or slow you down enough so that you can actually be paying attention and absorbing to what's going on. So I think they they actually can work together. Um, in, in my practice, I, um, I worked with someone who was a college student at, at Smith and she had a coach to help her with her academic stuff. Like basically mm -hmm. to set up um, planning and prioritizing and mm -hmm. calendaring the whole thing. Um, and that's what they worked on. You know, how do you, how do you, how are you going to plan for this paper? When are you going to do what? In our work, we were dealing with substance abuse, social anxiety, issues with, <laughs> um, you know, a, a fa family issues. So I, yeah. I, I yeah. there wasn't an, I didn't have, there was no way I could have done all that. Well, yeah. So, and, right. and let's ask a coach, when's the last time you coached through substance, substance abuse issues, Nick? No, yeah, uh, I don't. Right. <laughs> there you go. I don't, but I do the planning and, you yeah. know, what do you need to do to prepare for this yes. final? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, then, and, and yeah. that was a beautiful marriage as far as I was concerned. And there was a psychiatrist also. So, you know, yes. the whole treatment came together and, you know, I was in touch with everyone. And that's the thing that I would also want to say to every people who are listening is everybody who's listening is that if you have a psychiatrist and a therapist and a coach or a coach and a psychiatrist or a therapist, you know what I'm saying. If you have any combination right. of those, give them releases so they can talk to each other. I agree. It's really important. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not like, oh, you'll all be talking about me when I'm not there. It's actually, you know, hey, this is what I'm working on. What are you working on? Um, is there anything that I could do that would support your work more effectively? Uh, this mm -hmm. would help me with my work if you'd be willing to do that. And I think that you know, how lucky are you to have a few people working on your team to support you? It's like your sag wagon to, you know, moving toward that, um, you know, that finish line. I don't maybe that's not the right image, but, you know, like to be moving along as you're on your your bike trip in, in Italy, going from place to right. place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll take it. Well, and I, I got to tell you, too, as a coach, I think it's really helpful Um you know, to know where they're at. So, uh, you know, another example is I, I was talking to a, a psychiatrist who was wor working with the same client and I was concerned about working with her because I thought she was uh, in a, a, a very deep depression. And I wasn't sure if she was able to, you know, coaching is, is so much more, uh, it, well, not more, but it's about action, right? Yes. It's about what, what, what are you going to work on this week? And I was really concerned that that was going to backfire on us, you know? And so when I talked to the psychiatrist, it was so interesting to me because she said, no, I actually really think it would be helpful for you to be able to sit with her. And even if she just goes through her mail, or even if she just does something to get her to do something, even whatever that is that she wants to do, I think that's going to help. And I never really, I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't talked to her and really understood how we were helping her together. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I agree. I think the more, um, more communication we have, we really can better help the person and support the person. That's great. You know, I, I'm thinking back to a client uh, I had a long time ago, a uh, very, a very successful woman, a professional woman who, you know, had trouble with sorting her mail um, and, mm -hmm. you know, loves stables, went to stables. I said, get a big, um, either get a, you know, a, a accordion file um, or get, 
you know, four separate big files. And she brought in like a huge bag of mail and the files. And that's what we did. We just went through yep. <laughs> and then we were just processing while she was doing it, how she felt, why she felt bad about herself, how embarrassing it was to do it. And it was very helpful because then we were able to create a system. I think one of the the greatest benefits of therapy and coaching is you have somebody you can talk to about your ADHD, your depression, anxiety for a therapist, and it and there is no judgment and it's a safe place. And uh, and I remember somebody telling me, I there is nobody else I could talk to about my planner the way that I talk about my planner with you, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, and I think that that's one of the wonderful things of connecting with another human, you know, is being able to have that safe, safe place to talk about these things that maybe you don't want to talk to your husband or your partner or whatever with, you know, because it's not comfortable. Um, I am curious. I have, I have a couple of more questions and then I actually have three more questions. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. The first one I have, or yeah, the first one I have is what happens when your therapist tells you I'm moving or I can't see you, I'm retiring something where they have to end the relationship for whatever reason. And now you have to go and find a new therapist. And one of your biggest fears is, oh my gosh, I have to start all over. Yes. In those situations, uh, ideally, your therapist would give you some names of people and you would sign a release so that uh, your current therapist could share some key points of, of, of your history and what you've been working on so that it's not, you know, when you go to see the next person, it's like, oh, it's a completely blank slate. They have some idea of what's going on. Um, but you will have to tell your story. And while that seems, you know, burdensome and loathsome at the same time, there's actually value in it because you may be telling your story differently now, having been through therapy with that other person than you did when you told it the first time. So uh, that is wow, such a, a great really good point. awareness. I'm so glad you said yes. that that way, right? <laughs> that is amazing because you are the collected result of your experiences. And that includes all your past therapy. Yes. And, yeah. and, and, you know, I think that a lot of therapy, a lot of, um, I think a lot of coaches think therapy is all about the past and coaching is all about the present. I don't think that's the case. I think coaching is about action. Yeah. What are we going to do to get you to do X, Y, and Z? I think yeah. ther- therapy is about how is how is you know, sort of, is about so many things, but a couple of them might be how is what's happened in your past interfering with your ability to live fully in your present or to set to move into a future that is what you visualize. I think therapy is about being accountable for who you are in the present and make and and talking through and being open to exploring um, whatever is happening with you emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, that um, you want to ch- change or shift so that you can move into action in a way that feels um, synchronized with who you are. And finally, I think that therapy is a lot about self-awareness, you know, and, and learning how to accept yourself as you are, warts and all. And, and that is really, that's a life journey for all of us. You know, I mean, I feel like that's kind of why we're on the planet. And as you mature as into, you know, in adulthood, you know, this becomes your, 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 your really, you know, an important issue, you know, do you accept yourself as you are? How do you receive feedback, whether it's positive or negative? What do you do with that feedback? How can you hear things without, you know, collapsing into a pile of reject, a pile of negativity or rejection? You know, all of these things are part of it. And so I think that there is a lot, there are a lot of places where therapy and coaching really dovetail nicely. So a lot of the things that you just said, self-compassion. Mm-hmm is what comes to my mind. Yes. So having conversations with your clients then around being okay, acceptance is what, where does that well, come in? I, I to play? think it's, it's, it's more than sort of just like taking out the acceptance nail and hammering it. Um, you right. know, it's really about a kind of a dance that you do, you know, um, 
for me, I, I feel like, you know, I use humor and warmth and I do my best to express um, acceptance of where someone is. Um, I think uh, in, by the same token, I'm a little bit confrontational. You know, I'm going to call you on your stuff. That's my job. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that really people, um, people, particularly people with ADHD are very hard on themselves. I haven't mm-hmm. met anybody in my 30 years of being a psychologist who has ADHD, who doesn't carry around some shame about yeah. who they are or how they are. And, um, and that shame really, you know, it can be debilitating in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we, instead of working on like the acceptance now, we might work on the shame or the sensitivity to rejection or, um, uh, you know, a lack of self-confidence. And those come up in the kind of, you know, news and of daily, the news and actions of daily living, you know, I have to apply for a job or, you know, I have this, uh, this, uh, you know, girlfriend who isn't treating me the way I would like to be treated. Um, you know, I had an argument with my mother and I feel like she's just really critical, you know, and then that just, Mm -hmm activates my own self-criticism. We mm-hmm. want to look at all those mm-hmm. things. Um, I think that's partially, you know, in a way, um, particularly where um, internal family systems is so helpful because we're looking at, you know, um, different parts of ourselves that, you know, the part of ourselves that's self-critical, the part of ourself that loves to do art, the part of ourself, you know, that um, might be kind of goofy. Um, they're all there and it's where we want to put our attention and how we want to, you know, in, you know, sort of talk to them and deal with them. Okay. So I'm going to pivot back to my other two questions. Excellent. <laughs> Is there an end to therapy? Oh, that's up to you. Okay. So there are people I work with. So, you know, I'm working with someone now and I went from seeing them every week to every other week. And now like every second session is canceled because of this, that, and the other thing. So that's a message to me that they're doing pretty well in a couple of years and um, they're ready to probably let go. They don't want to let go because, you know, it's, it's scary to let go. Um, But I also have someone I'm working with who I haven't seen in 12 years who called and said, you know, uh, you know, I just, um, I got a new job and I got married and I'd really like to come talk to you. So, you know, it it just, it depends. I think, you know, when the set for me, when the sessions are like pretty much mostly about chit chat, then we're done. You know, Mm -hmm. and I like Mm -hmm. to say, well, it's not over. I like to say, we're going to press pause because you may want to circle back with me or someone else. And that's totally fine. But right now I think you're okay. That's a really good point. I like that. We can push pause because it really, it isn't just with coaching too. It comes and goes. I mean, there's times in your life where you might feel like everything's really in place, but then you do, you get a new job, you get married, you lose a job, something happens. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, I I need that little extra structure and accountability and, and so forth. And and it's not that you're okay. Like I want to just say something because it's like you're managing well on your own. And you've now internalized our conversations and our work, and you can use it on your own Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. well enough. And when you need a tweak, it's like you take your car, you get your car serviced every whatever, six, nine, 12, 15 years, (laughs) nine, 12 months or 15 years, depending on who you are and how you do it. Um, then that's the same thing. Like, you know, I need people come back and like, I need a little refresher. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay. Mm-hmm. It's a training a wheels thing, support. right? It's yeah. a training yeah. wheels thing. Exactly. We can, we can take those off for a little while. Sure. And if it feels like you took just one off and now you're just riding in circles, you can always come back. Exactly. You can do that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, my last question, and thank you so much for bearing with, with us today. Uh, it is hard to find a therapist right now. Oh yeah. <laughs> they are in 
high demand. And do you feel, Nikki, uh, do you feel a little guilty doing this show with Sharon when she could be working with someone who's struggling to find a, an appointment right now? No, I feel this just is a little my bit guilty. lunch. No, no, this is my lunch hour. So no one. <laughs> okay. No one, All right. Okay. All right. So no everybody guilt. Gotta okay. eat. Everybody's got to eat. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, but it is really hard. And I mean, I know this from personal experience. I have a 16 year old and she was struggling, has ADHD and anxiety, eating disorder, all kinds of stuff going on. I can't find a therapist in town that is open. Luckily, she connects with the school counselor. Mm -hmm. So, That's great. you know, we've been told from her doctor, make sure she leans on her because it is so hard to find someone. I know that this isn't just a, a, an Oregon problem. This is a problem everywhere. If you can't find a therapist right now for whatever reason, what do you suggest people do? How can they still help themselves? It's a really great question. Uh, I'm away, all the way across the country here in Massachusetts and people can't find therapists either. Um, mm -hmm. So the first thing you want to do is get your name on waiting lists. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And be persistent, you know, call once a month and say, Hey, you know, you have my name. I'm wondering if there's been any change in status. Um, it, that helps a lot. You might um, talk to your primary care provider, pediatrician or nurse practitioner or whoever you see as an adult uh, and ask them if they could help you find someone because you know, or that you've called this person, would your primary care provider be willing to make a call on your behalf? Uh, right now, part of the problem is that therapists just are overwhelmed because of the demand, but also because I think that a lot of us feel like we can't spend eight hours doing therapy online every day the way we might have had a toler been able to tolerate or do therapy you know when I say tolerate because you know it takes a while to kind of yeah. build up your ability to do that um in person it's very different mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um and it's it's draining in a particular way I know that mm -hmm. for me I'm actually trying actively to shift to doing some therapeutic what I call therapeutic coaching groups where mm -hmm. um it you know there's there online. I'm just, just recently decided that that would be more useful because I can reach more people. I can't, I'm only one right. person. And so uh, I think that that's something to look at also, you know, are there some groups available that would be mm -hmm. helpful? Um, and, and not, and I guess the main thing I want to say is like, don't give up. Like, I know it's yeah. discouraging, but keep at it, keep calling people, the people who call me, who email me, who say, you know, please, do you have anything I need to be on your list? You know, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I have a long list, but they're, they're in the field mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. my vision a little yeah. bit more mm -hmm. than people who call once and then I don't hear from them again. Well, and, right. and I love that you said that about your, your therapy groups online. I know that is another part of sort of the evolution of practice that we've mm -hmm. seen, yeah. uh, you know, over the last 18 months, two years. And I, I think there might be just a, uh, something to, to ask of yourself as a potential client to, to take advantage of groups, even though you might have it in your head that the only thing that's going to help you is one-on-one -on -one cognitive therapy. Right. I think that's really important. You yourself have to be flexible. Um, there's certainly a lot of, uh, there are a lot more group options online than there used to be. And uh, there's also classes, you know, like mindfulness mm -hmm. classes or, you know, I know um, my, the Kristen Neff's organization does a lot of classes um, and there are things for teens as well. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. it's hard because, you know, one of the challenges is that at, in in child development you need actually to be with people and and see their faces yeah. and feel their connection. Um, that's a part of what people need um, to really develop the skills to be you know sufficiently relational and satisfied in how they connect with people, and that's been challenging. Whew. Thank you, though, so much yeah. for your, uh, it's so good to hear somebody talk about this that does it every day, okay. <laughs> every day and, and, and can help us understand it more. Uh, really, really appreciate you it. You are most welcome. And I, I want to just 
thank you for your thoughtful questions. Uh, I really appreciate talking with you. You're both so um, curious and well-informed. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Oh, Very thank kind. You. Well, tell us, tell us about uh, your, your latest projects. What, are you, latest what, is, what, project, what does it look like when you're not eating lunch and podcasting? I'm not eating lunch. I've been doing um, a bunch of, you know, writing articles. I have mm -hmm. a webinar coming up for attitude, my attitude.com. Uh, in January that I'm really excited about on perfectionism. And cool. I do a Facebook Live for Attitude every Friday at four. People come from all around the world. There are various topics. Check out my Facebook page uh, at drsharonceline.com or go to Attitude Mag, um, their Facebook page. And um, sort of throwing around a few ideas for my next book. And I've been doing a bunch of school consultation, which I've really enjoyed. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, wow. For those who don't have the deck, you got to talk about the deck. and the, Oh, my and card the deck. So, so yeah, my card yeah, yeah. deck is really fun and it's very useful because it's my five C's, um, self-control, compassion, collaboration, consistency, and celebration in card deck form. So there are five C's and five suits. And each card has a quote from a kid and perhaps a parent, um, a challenge and a, a tool. And so you can work your way through the deck. You can say, oh, I need some compassion today. I'm just going to pick a compassion card. Uh, or you say, hey, you know, I think I've been kind of down and out. I'm going to pick a celebration card. Um, you can leave them in the bathroom so your kids can pick cards for themselves. Um, <laughs> you could play... Um, you know, a fun game somehow with them. So it's a really different way of getting the information. That's well, great. it's all lovely. We'll Love put it. links to all of that thank stuff you. in the show notes. Thank you. Sharon Celine, thank you. Truly, thank you so much for being here, for helping us and the community. You're we welcome. appreciate it. My pleasure. <laughs> and thank you everyone for downloading and listening to this very show. Thank you for your time and your attention. Don't forget, if you have something to contribute, you've got questions, you want to talk to the community, head over to the Show Talk channel in our Discord server, and you can join us right there by becoming a supporting member at the deluxe level. On behalf of Nikki Kinzer and Dr. Sharon Celine, I am Pete Wright, and we'll see you right back here next week on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast. Mm -hmm.